The Northampton State Hospital looms large above the city of Northampton, Massachusetts as a familiar and mysterious icon. Its once impressive buildings and pristine grounds now stand dilapidated and choked with overgrown brush and vines, pulling in those who are drawn to its history, its intrigue, and its spirit. Both truth and myth permeate the rise and fall of the Northampton State Hospital, and the voices of those who were patients, caregivers, advocates, and historians will attempt to create an honest and accurate account of this historical and social institution. To get here, you had to be, like, disturbed to the max. I mean, this was the end of the line. So pretty much all of them were pretty disturbed. One hour in the Northampton State Hospital was, you know, the beginning for many people of a death sentence. Uh, my admissions at the State Hospital were interesting to say the least. Mm -hmm. It was, um, it was a world unto itself. Mm -hmm. And I just remember that it smelled so stale. It had the smell of human beings who were being who were wasting time. I got to see a side of life that I think very few people get to see of what human beings how, about human suffering. And many of the patients who were admitted were so um, wrapped up in their own world. When it opened, it was the Northampton Lunatic Hospital. And then later on, it became the Northampton Insane Hospital. And sometimes people called it the Insane Asylum. And then in the early part of the century, the name got changed to the Northampton State Hospital. And so the hospital opened in 1858. People who had resources and people who were relatively well off off wealthy rich always had the option of private physicians and private institutions but not everybody could afford that and so the dominant mode of treatment for people without resources was that they were put into institutions uh, by putting people into institutions that were kind of removed from society and in sort of nice naturally beautiful surroundings that that would have a curative effect on people. Uh, they, they were actually, they actually extracted people from the community and created a community onto themselves. So in some ways, it was during the age of moral treatment, it was called, uh, during the uh, mid-1800s, because at that time, that was seen as the, the best way to treat people who were mentally ill. Prior to that, um, many of the mentally ill were in jails and almshouses, which were like poor farms, and really not receiving any treatment whatsoever. So the concept of the institution at first was a very benevolent concept, uh, where people could come and receive treatment, short-term or long-term treatment, and also learn some skills. And that's why many of the institutions that you see have large farms, uh, because they used to produce their own food, whether it be, you know, raising uh, you know, gardens for vegetables. Uh, some of them used to have large beef herds. Some of them had milking, uh, milking herds. Some of them had chickens. And all the institutions, uh, depending on what they focused on, used to exchange those types of resources for support. So they were a community on for themselves. What types of treatments were practiced during the early years of the state hospital? Well, at first, the treatments were primarily um, trying to re-educate people. And a lot of it focused around, you know, learning skills and work. Um, many of the hospitals opened under what was called the Protestant work, work ethic, that, you know, uh, if, if you worked and uh, uh, had good moral fiber, therefore you, you wouldn't have been mentally ill to begin with, because people uh, thought that mental illness was really caused by, by being lazy and, and not, uh, not energetic, so many of the Interventions, obviously, were to try to put people to work, to try to train people and give them skills. Um, today, we, we know that that's not, that's not why people have a mental illness. Uh, the stereotypical notions about what kinds of abuses there were and what kinds of strange, you know, to our way of thinking these days, treatments there were, like hydrotherapy and, you know, isolation and electroconvulsive treatment and 
and those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, to some extent, those kinds of things did go on at the hospital. And to some extent, they may have had some therapeutic effects, and maybe not. You know, but certainly, that's one of the other ways in which our thinking has evolved a bit. The primary form of intervention um, that existed at that time was pain. You know, was causing people pain. You know, whether you know. Uh, tying them down, being in physical restraints, um, um, congregating people so that they scream and yell at each other, um, or putting them in cold packs, or um, doing things that were assault on the senses. The idea from the very beginning was that mental illness was a kind of plague, and that you would sort of purge it in some way. And so one tried to you know, either bloodlet or do certain things that always cause physical pain. And it was not a warm, kind of cozy environment. First of all, if you look at the building, it doesn't look warm and cozy. Um, but more importantly, they, and that was, but that was because uh, what we knew about how to respond to psychiatric disabilities was to try to shock the senses, think you could kind of like blow this out of someone's brain, you know, and it doesn't work that way. We know that now. You know, and later on we thought we could shock it out, literally shock it out someone's system where we could give them enough drugs that we could kind of just, um, you know, manipulate the chemistry in some fashion. And that the, those things aren't true. And it's just like any other uh, misfounded notion of how to cure an, an illness. You know, we were doing much more harm to people than um, we ever got. Now, I think the intention was not to do harm. The intention has never been to do harm. You know, I don't think anyone, the superintendent at the state hospital or any of the workers were there to cause pain. You know, I think they were there for the most beneficent of motives. It's just, we had it all wrong. At the time, they didn't really have too much of a choice of medication, even though they did improve from the 50s. A lot of the um, treatment was injectable medication to calm people down, um, or restrain people from hurting themselves or uh, hurting somebody else or putting the person in solitary confinement for the same purpose, you know, because their behavior was so out of control, there was nothing more you could really do. Nothing that I would consider that helpful to anybody, uh, therapeutic or anything, as they call it, you know, healing. I didn't see a lot of healing taking place here at all. Many of the people who were there um, were people who uh, had mental retardation problems as opposed to being mentally ill. Um, some, some people uh, were housed in institutions uh, who were epileptics, in fact. Uh, those people clearly didn't need to be there. And many of the mentally ill who were really not a danger to themselves or others clearly didn't need to be there. There was also a growing elderly population that, that could be cared better or in either medical facilities or in community programs. The state hospital was primarily for adults. It was really not a place you would want kids to be. But there were kids who got hospitalized there. And we did everything we could to keep them out. The kids who were admitted were psychotic. They were delusional. They were hallucinating. They were really living in another reality. and. But that wasn't enough. Then their behavior would get out of control. They would get violent, they would be assaultive, they would be just wrecking havoc in whatever environment they were in, or really suicidal. And people felt like they just couldn't, they just didn't know what to do anymore. No one ever even conceived of an adolescent unit. We did not want adolescents there. We felt like it was really detrimental to them. You know, if you were already wigged out and having trouble, being in reality to sort of be on a locked ward that um, had patients there who were had been there for ages, who were kind of schluffing around, bumming cigarettes. Um, you know, if you were a kid who was psychotic and you looked and saw that in your future, it would be incredibly demoralizing. You know, it was a very sad place in that way. But that's where kids went. There was really no routine to speak of. Um, 
there was nothing to do. There was nothing to do. It was sitting around all day. Um, it was the same way at the VA. It was, you just sat around and did nothing. Um, so we would watch the staff. We would watch each other just for something to do. Um, I couldn't go off the unit. Other people could go off the unit. Sometimes people got privileges and they could go out for a walk. It was the best thing in the world to just go out for a walk. Mm -hmm. uh, just having volunteers come up and uh, take us out for a walk. When, when you're confined in a little tiny space, your whole world changes and your priorities change and it becomes the best thing in the world just to go out for a walk. <laughs> we, there were a lot of people who wanted to come up and see the hospital. They wanted to see a unit like we were zoo animals or something and like we weren't really people we were we were we were things to be looked at and this was a little a little cage that people wanted to tour so we had all these people a lot of politicians local politicians people that i now in my in my role as as a local uh, someone seeking public office i now have to deal with as an equal which is really weird for me uh, but, but all these people would come up on the unit to tour the unit. And we would all be there sitting on our beds uh, in the worst possible condition we've ever been in in our lives. And we would have these people come in and, and just stare at us <laughs> and look at us. My, what an interesting person. And it was, it was terrible. It was, it was a terrible feeling to be treated like that. Right. There were groups, there were dances, there were movies. Um, sometimes there were excursions out into the community, like if there was a circus or a fair or a something, a few people would go. Um, there wasn't any gym, there wasn't any, like, exercise. It was a pretty sedentary place, except for maybe the, some of the dances that night. Down below, down there, there was a two-lane bowling alley also. Which, I for the patients, for the and patients. staff yeah. at night, they would have bowling leagues. They would get one or two of the clients that were good clients, probably pay them 10 cents for the night to set pins, because they didn't have automatic pin setters back then. Uh, they even had uh, theater, um, theater groups that came in here. Um, they were all treated very well, even up to the day when they left. I mean, I believe they were treated fairly on a daily basis. Um, uh, it was very difficult for staff to intervene without tools. People were cared for, not cured. One of the things that eventually emerged, and this sort of varies throughout, throughout the history, but it was also understaffed and underfunded. And as the population expanded and as it's underfunded and it's understaffed, then that means that the quality of care deteriorates. And the clinical staff that I supervised, I was really impressed by. They were not, they didn't all have, you know, high level professional degrees, but they were very dedicated to what they did. They worked more hours than they were paid for. I think of it as sort of a family job. They worked there, their mothers worked there, their fathers worked there, their daughters worked there, their aunts and uncles worked there in some, you know, in maintenance or laundry or on the wards or whatever. And they'd been there most of their career. and. They actually, many of them, got very close to some of the patients and would take them home for holidays, you know? So they'd join the family Christmas or on Sunday afternoon for dinner or sometimes they'd take them out to a movie or... This was all on their own time. It was like just caring. And then there was some dead wood and then there was some stuff that... I mean, I know there were some alcoholics there. I know there were some uh, staff who... Um, we would eventually catch on, had hit a patient, or had in some way become involved in a brawl that wasn't necessary. I got a job uh, on the men's ward in 1985, I believe. There were 50 male patients, myself, one female LPN, practical nurse, and seven male staff workers that worked with me. Uh, and we had some interesting doctors come in at that time. I, I kind of liked it when we had doctors with new ideas. I used to like to talk to them and look for ways that we could improve things. Um, but it was very sad because they didn't stay long. 
if you got a good doctor, they lasted a year, you just get used to them, you get attached to the person, and then they would leave. I started to uh, run little patient groups when I worked the second shift, uh, which was something that people didn't do. It's very common now, but it wasn't common then. And I developed this little group called the self-image group that used to meet a couple of nights a week, and just had my, developed, started my own little treatment thing. That, and it wasn't really treatment, it was we just hung out and talked and talked about different things. And these clients were very sick. I mean, they, the fact that they could stay in the same room for a half hour, 45 minutes was a big deal. I think there were probably issues of rotality towards patients, a lot of which, I'd say the majority of which was unintended. I mean, when we look back at mental health treatment from, you know, today's perspective, we see many of the things we, we've done as being kind of archaic and maybe brutal. Um, when people used to be restrained, the primary method of restraint was to wrap people in sheets and to hold them down. Uh, today that's seen as being pretty inhumane and brutal. They did not treat me very well. <laughs> they treated anyone well, but they treated me kind of worse. And so I did not get privileges. I didn't, I didn't um, get any benefits. They wouldn't even let me go to, uh, to dinner in the cafeteria. I had to eat on the unit so they could keep an eye on me. And, and I would tell people what I thought of what was happening. Like, you can't do that to that person. Um, you can't do that to me. <laughs> you know, this is a bad thing. You can't do that. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I was a troublemaker in their eyes. We did have some bad clients here. I mean, we had clients that put, you know, four or five people into early retirement. But basically, I was, I was kind of lucky, I guess, because I've, I've only had about two or three run-ins with patients. Uh, the worst cases weren't, uh, you know, where the, around the, the holidays, New Year's and Christmas and New Year's, they used to, the place would bring all the uh, drunks that they would pick up up here and trying to get them into seclusion, you know, to put them into their own room where they couldn't hurt themselves, you know, and everything. That was terrible. That was terrible to have to put people in like that. I mean, that, they, they, they were just, you know, so drunk that, you know, they were kind of, uh, violent and everything, so it's it was terrible. So it was usually about discipline? Yeah. yeah. But the the clients I had very few run ins with clients. The only, thing that, the only thing I remember was uh, we had a uh, a female patient that had to be sedated once and they needed guys to hold her down while they sedated her. She was very wild. And uh, oh I tell you we, that was one heck of a wrestling match. It really was. There was two guys and this girl going around, and, and I know I kept yelling out, "Don't put that needle in the wrong body." <laughs> but that was that was it. I was kind of lucky. I, I really never got into any. Did you real observe scripts. like other people who got like oh, yeah. seriously hurt? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I had seen I had seen other guys getting hurt. What would you say was the most like serious injury uh, employee ever received from a patient? I was. Um, we had uh, broken arms, broken legs. You know, that was basically it. And I used to sit in the cafeteria and eat with the, with the patients, by the way, which is not what most of the staff did. They st stood up against the wall. Um, I always found it more interesting to talk to the patients. And I don't, I'm not saying this to try to glorify myself I, I, at all. I, I just like talking to the patients. Uh, and she, I was talking to this person who I kind of became one of those patients. And, yeah, she told me she was an art therapist. That was what she did before she got sick, you know. And I was, and I was new, so I'm thinking, wow, you know, she's an art therapist, and look where she is. I mean, she was one of the six people on the ward that we had to put in seclusion all the time. She was really one of those people that when she went manic, she was really, you know, out of control really bad. Um, and she said, yeah, you never know when you're going to be on the other side of the table. Did any of the patients ever escape from me? Mm-hmm. All the time. Wow. <laughs> we were very, very careful about keeping track of where people were. So if they were gone, they weren't really gone too long. And the security officer would have to go out looking, and most of the time they would take the nurse with them, and I'd have to go in the car, and we'd go all over looking for people. I, I went on many of those tours of Northampton looking for people. Sometimes they'd be 
down the street, you know, maybe half dressed or something like that, <laughs> or, or not dressed at all. But the way people would um, escape, so to speak, I guess the, the, another term, away without authority was what, what we call the AWA, would be if they were out on grounds privileges, like, you know, when people, once people were here for a while and the medicine was working okay and they were stable, you know, they would go outside. You know, and they'd ha they had they had like two hours, say for example, of afternoon grounds privileges, like say from two to four. So there would be someone on the ward that's supposed to make sure that by four o'clock that person was in. Mm -hmm. And if they weren't, they had to tell the nurse, and then the nurse had to do something about it, like call security and say, look, so and so has is in back. Can you go? Then they start circling the the uh, the grounds and start there and go down. Then they went, ended up going downtown. Well, there were lots of, it was a pretty intense place, so we're sort of full of intense kinds of things. Um, I would say one of the, um, one of the scariest actually was when this kid escaped one year, because he was perceived as really dangerous. And I'm not sure he was dangerous to anyone but the person he had murdered. But so it wasn't just a random murder, he killed somebody he knew. Reason. What it was, I never knew because he never was in reality enough when this kid escaped. And I didn't know where he went, and it was night. And um, I um, I didn't put it past him to look in the phone book and found where, find where I lived. <laughs> um, and I thought that if anyone was in danger, it would be people who were close to him, and I was one who was. So. Um, I remember scouting around the perimeter of my house to make sure I didn't have any crowbars, axes, gas for the mower, you know, all the kind of stuff you sort of have around your house and around your yard. And, um, and I sort of hauled it all in the house and locked the doors and waited to hear back, because the hospital called me immediately to say he was gone, you better be careful. So um, I'd say that was one of the scarier times. And it turned out he hadn't headed toward my house at all. He'd headed toward home and they picked him up and brought him back. As a result of meeting a lot of people, hundreds and hundreds of people, um, I became fairly clear that many, many people, um, the vast majority of people in the hospital at that time, didn't really need to be there. They could live in the community if they were given the right kind of support and treatment. So after trying a kind of case-by-case -case approach for four or five years, I decided to bring a class action. A class action means a case on behalf of a whole group of people. Um, so I filed this lawsuit in 1976 on behalf of David Brewster, who was one of the people I met, um, and seven other individuals who, like him, uh, had been sort of left to die at the Northampton State Hospital. So the class was all the people who had been uh, discharged, who were there now, and who might be admitted uh, during the course of the lawsuit. Um, the settlement was, took about a year to negotiate, because it had a lot of, all the details of how many programs and what type and where they'd be located and who the staff would be and so on and so forth, what it would cost. Um, and then it took about 12 years to implement. So during the course of the litigation, the state finally agreed to settle, and the settlement uh, process involved negotiating a plan. The plan is the, the details of what would happen in Western Massachusetts in terms of expanded community services so that people could leave the hospital and be safely and compassionately cared for in the community. For the consent decree, was a consequence of a class action suit brought on behalf of patients by public service, um, legal services lawyers in Western Massachusetts who um, were appalled by what they saw at the hospital in the state that it, it, it had gotten to in the mid-1970s. The, the state had a legal, moral, and economic responsibility to provide alternative arrangements for people to receive care and to receive services. What, what's emerged is a whole alternative system of treating people. The, the alternative structure that exists, there's this whole 
sector of the economy of Northampton and other places all over the state that's directed towards providing services to people who are clients of the Department of Mental Health. And a lot of that's totally invisible. People live in group homes and some people live in homes that are more structured than that. Some people live in their own apartments and have social workers who, um, you know, who are their case workers. And a lot of that we just don't see. You know, it's a part of what what happens on a normal day-to-day -day business. And there are people whose jobs it is to provide care and services and advice for people who are clients of the Department of Mental Health. The hospital actually phased down over a series of about 15 years. Um, when the, uh, the Brewster consent decree was signed and went into effect, uh, it was 1978. And we had uh, about 300 and 86 patients still at the hospital. From 1978 through 1993, when we finally closed the hospital, um, basically it had been gradually phased down year after year with the opening of more and more community programs. So we probably we, we opened up uh, programs which could which could accommodate literally everyone who lived at the hospital. The final closure there. During the final closure, there were only 18 people still at the hospital who were considered in need of continued inpatient treatment. Uh, for those individuals, we opened a unit in Springfield, uh, and we contracted with Springfield Municipal Hospital to open up a psychiatric unit that was going to be our replacement for the state hospital. The objective was in terms of putting people back into their communities, to put them back into the community that they come from or the community where their family was. Um, but some of the people came from Northampton and some of the people who left the hospital stayed in Northampton, either because they didn't want to go back to where they came from or they didn't have family wherever they came from. Um, and the mayor's office in the 19... 80s. I'm not exactly sure when it started, but it was probably most fully operational during the 1980s. Actually, had a committee that was focused on the consequences of deinstitutionalization and the impacts on the city of Northampton. But the extent to which there were problems, the most important resource in the town in terms of dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis were the police. Like there are more and more people in, in Northampton and elsewhere who, who have a deeper understanding of it and actually try to engage people, you know, as opposed to trying to ignore them. The bottom line is that if as a society and a community we really do want to provide help to people who, through no fault of their own, have something about them that causes the rest of us to think of them as, as uh, um, deviant or odd or that they have some kind of condition that, that causes differences in the way they behave um, from, from many of the rest of us. Um, those people could be any one of us. Um, they could be our family members. Um, and in some grander sense, they are members of our communities, and ultimately, I'd argue that we're responsible and that as a good society, we ought to do a better job of providing the care um, that we provide to those people.